I'm Daniel Eisenberg. I'm, I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Health here at the University of Michigan and one of the co-organizers of the conference. And I also have the privilege of moderating, moderating this last session, which will focus on some new projects using uh, online media, online technologies to address student mental health. And I, I was thinking about why I think these three projects that are going to be presented, three plus projects, um, are especially exciting for college student mental health. And I th because there is a lot going on in terms of use of technology to address mental health for young people and, and other populations. I think what's especially exciting about these projects is that they're 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 not just about the online component. I think in each case, there's there's some some embedding of the technology into the college context and in some ways of reaching, uh, kind of linking, linking the online interventions with some in-person, some more traditional approaches or curriculum uh, programs. And so I think that, that, that I think is the best way to take full advantage of the opportunity in the college setting where you have, you have so many ways to reach people, not just online, you have all of these other ways and I think it's in some ways the best of the traditional approaches combined with these newer, exciting approaches. So each of our uh, panelists will spend about 10 to 15 minutes presenting their work, and then we'll have questions and discussion after that. And so we'll start with, uh, with Scott Casino, who uh, is the, the founder of MyStrength.com, and, and I'll, let, I'll let you tell him, I'll let him tell you more about that. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Dan. Uh, thank you, Daniel and, and Trish and, and John. Also, a big thanks. I'm uh, a proud alum of the University of Michigan, so it's been a, a really exciting, interesting week for me to be back, both as a former student uh, and now a business leader who really is passionately focused about using technology to extend evidence-based access to those in need. Um, as Daniel mentioned, our company is MyStrength.com, um, and we're a Denver-based organization. And the, the, the mission of the company is really to work with payers and healthcare providers to integrate technology as a means to overcome uh, obstacles of cost, stigma, and, and lack of access that often preclude most from getting care and treatment. And so what I had hoped to do today is very quickly walk through a little bit more about the company and, and about our organization, but very specifically talk about the model, and in particular, do a quick demonstration of our recently launched mobile application, just to give you a, a, a quick uh, user experience feel. Uh, before we go forward, just a, a, a very brief background on why we formed MyStrength. We like to talk about the why before the what. Um, we formed uh, MyStrength three years ago, myself and a co-founder by the name of Matt Sopich. And we, we uh, started the company, I think, as very stereotypical entrepreneurs do. We started with a question on a napkin. And the question read, could the internet, if used thoughtfully and appropriately, help those with mental health disorders get better and stay better? And there were two reasons why we asked ourselves that question. The first was, uh, for most of our, our recent careers, we had uh, been internet executives and operators. I was a former online university college president Matt was the executive director of e-commerce at Quest Communications. And between the two of us, we have had this incredible front row seat to the incredible disruption, innovation of the internet, and the ability to use the internet to deliver information in very effective ways. The second reason we asked ourselves that question was our own personal experience with mental illness. Uh, Matt lost a brother to suicide, and I went through depression uh, post-college for an extended period of time. And in my particular case, really struggled with stigma. I thought what I had was very unique, uh, a character issue, as I'm sure many of you have heard from uh, the students that, that, that you support. And through financial means and, and great uh, su family support, I was able to get um, care. Uh, I was exposed to CBT and had a life-changing outcome. And so for us, it's this wonderful confluence of this deep, broad consumer experience, but really coupled with this passion that we have for using technology to really apply it to the behavioral health space. The tipping point for us, as I led a company of 600 employees and as we did a deep diagnostic of our healthcare-related costs, 
And as we understood and began to appreciate how much of that cost was emanating from behavioral health related conditions, we invited our insurance company to come in, make a presentation, and we were incredibly disappointed with what we saw in terms of online tools. And that was, I think, the last virtual push for us to really begin to, to push forward and, and, and focus on my strength. Before we talk a bit about my strength, um, a couple of the perhaps obvious and self-evident slides. Um, we've been very fortunate to begin discussions here at the university with Daniel and the Depression Center about beginning to pilot uh, the My Strength applications, both web and, and mobile-based. And I think in particular, uh, if there was ever a, a targeted audience for technology that, that, that we envision, it's, it's really the college student population. Uh, the slide in front of you is, is painfully evident to most of you in terms of the prevalence of depression, um, and unfortunately, the lack of, uh, of access to some degree, but, but I think a number of other obstacles that preclude most who suffer from getting any form of care or treatment. This was a study uh, that actually was done by Daniel uh, at 15 colleges, 8,500 students, 22% uh, getting minimally adequate um, service and support. And so for us, the opportunity is, can the internet, not used in isolation, as Daniel said, but in partnership in concert with direct intervention, really help to soften some of those, those obstacles? And as we look at a recent CDC report um, who uh, evaluated 425 colleges, spoke to over 7,500 students, perhaps, again, not unsurprisingly, the number one source of information around health-related issues for a college student is the internet. Uh, by far and away. I think the other interesting issue or, or, or research finding was that when they asked these same students, though, what is the most trusted source of information, almost 90% of the students said the college services or mental health professionals. And again, I think it really helps to uh, identify that, that really healthy balance between technology but also human intervention. Um, and then lastly, perhaps the most obvious slide, just in terms of how wired the population is. Again, um, I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, very much appreciated by those in the room, but whether it be the web access or in the case of, of uh, the, the gadgets, so to say, the average college student has six gadgets and consumes close to 12 hours of digital media every day. Um, and the trends, particularly around mobile, um, which we believe and many believe to be the most disruptive um, innovation that will really carry forward is something that, that I think will really fundamentally change and alter the way that uh, healthcare and in the case of behavioral healthcare is delivered. Um, and, and lastly, if, if, if the Cousineau household is any indication of where we're going, I have a kindergartner who is learning on an electronic whiteboard um, and is exposed to computers, and a eight-year-old who told us right before Christmas that we were the only family on the entire planet that didn't have an iPod, or iPad, I should say. Not the state of Denver or the city of Denver, or, uh, but, but the entire planet. And I think this slide, and I actually stole this from a community health clinician who has really embraced technology in a slightly more humorous way, I think really begins to depict, I think, the trending around technology and intervention. So as we think about not just the co college population, but the population in totality, we, we often talk about three distinct attributes. That's access to the technology, demand, are consumers looking for this kind of information? And is this, it, are these interventional protocols effective? And so we've talked a lot about the, the accessibility, demand at the most highest level, third most popular activity online is seeking out uh, Health-related information, the fastest growing consumer subset are those consumers looking for depression and anxiety information, over 60 million searches uh, last year alone. Um, and then lastly, in a very abridged fashion, there's been a tremendous amount of research, particularly over the last five to seven years, um, really validating outcome improvement when computer-assisted uh, cognitive behavioral therapy in particular is used to augment direct intervention um, significant improvement in, in, in outcomes. Um, now segueing directly to, to my strength, just a quick video just to give you a quick overview. 
Many things affect our moods, big life changes, past experiences, random events, and sometimes it feels like our moods are controlling us. We struggle to get out of bed. We feel stressed during the day or anxious at night. Find hope in MyStrength.com. Like a virtual gym for the mind, MyStrength offers a range of proven self-help resources, empowering you with tools and inspiration to manage life's challenges and strengthen overall well-being. Each time you come to MyStrength, you'll find new and unique personalized applications, like motivational resources and e-learning programs to help you manage anxious or depressive thoughts or feelings. You'll also find tailored wellness tools just for you, and spiritual or faith-based materials if you like, to help you build a strong mind, body, and spirit. And it's all completely safe and confidential. My Strength doesn't share your information with anyone. Proven, personal, and private. MyStrength.com is always here for you. Register today and start with the personalized wellness assessment. So um, while we're kind of working through the technology, a little bit more about MyStrength. So we launched uh, in beta uh, at the end of last year to two large community health networks in the state of Colorado. Um, 500 clinicians are using MyStrength to augment direct intervention, referring patients to the site. Um, those betas went exceptionally well to the point now where we're working with the majority of the community health networks in the state of Colorado along with a number of commercial uh, insurance and EAP organizations. At this point, we have roughly four million covered lives that are, are gaining access uh, to my strength, either through EAP uh, or uh, directly through community or county behavioral health networks. Um, the basic value proposition um, for um, for my strength is, as Daniel said, not to replace intervention. Our, our view is the, the best outcome is produced when the best of digital combines with the best of, of human interaction. And for us, it's how can we offer a scalable, effective resource beyond just static, random, and in some cases, low quality content that exists on the internet. Um, and just to, to begin to conclude a little bit more about what we believe and, and how we think about technology in this space, because we are, uh, we are not of the opinion that if you build it, they will come. In fact, quite the opposite. We believe that um, it's very important to integrate the technology into traditional protocols. Back to that CDSC finding, the most trusted source of information are the healthcare professionals. So we need to make sure that the healthcare professionals are excited and engaged in the referral process. Our, secondly, our consumer experience is all about mind, body, spirit. Um, it's very important for us to ensure not only that we have evidence-based protocols and, and self-help resources uh, to really focus on the mental health aspect, but also offer up nutritional weight management resources. And then for those that so select, in a personal profile that shapes their own personal homepage that's refreshed every day, spiritual content. Um, for most, uh, research clinicians tell us how important spirituality is, and we've chosen to be very purposeful but very sensitive in that we ask the consumer if spiritual wellness is important and if they have an affiliation, we've licensed simple daily devotionals across the, the face spectrum. The last piece before I shift over to the mobile, um, we have an exclusive partnership with a publisher that many of the clinicians probably are familiar with, New Harbinger. They have really cornered the market on evidence-based self-help uh, workbooks. And so what we've done, we've started with depression and anxiety, and we've taken those workbooks and converted those workbooks into interactive individual modules, each with a, an interactive tool. Um, la lastly, in terms of how we focus and think about behavioral health with technology, Increasingly, uh, we're really understanding that motivation plays a critical role, and so as BJ Fogg, who runs the Persuasive Technology Lab out of San Francisco, would tell us much more articulately, it's really important when we think about behavioral change and technology that we go to where the consumer is. It's very hard to incent motivation, and so as we appreciate that when the consumer is at a higher or elevated state of motivation, they can work on some of the tougher things, they can do the cognitive restructuring, but conversely, and oftentimes they're at the lower stages, where coping tools or in-the-moment tools um, are, are really important, which is uh, another set of resources. Very quickly, just in terms of the mobile application. So 
So um, the, the, the mobile application for us, again, kind of combines the need to um, integrate the familiar, contemporary, fun, and exciting with evidence-based content. And one of the ways that we do that is we have, have licensed exclusively with a neuroscientist out of Cornell, the photographic affect meter, which is basically a 16-point grid, each point on the grid corresponding to a mood state. And he's been able to determine that a picture can represent a mood state um, through a number of different trials and, and testing. And we think it's just a much more inviting way than asking a consumer, how do you feel today? Um, perhaps pick a picture. Um, and so I'm going to pick the rather agitated gentleman to the, the upper left. And so what you'll see is we try to guide the consumer through some short form interventions, some immediate activities. Um, and then based upon their response, we're again trying to guide them into other categories that we think or they think would be relative and important to them. And what we're doing is presenting in the moment resources. I'll, I'll ch play just Hi, very briefly. I'm Dr. Daniel Hedelman, and I'm here with a My Strength tip from the pros. Depression can stem from a lot of different factors. We know a lot about the kinds of things that cause depression. Genetic factors, social factors, and even interpersonal relationships can play a role in people develop. Additionally, um, different categories. There's a favorite category uh, that has um, mindfulness acceptance practices, meditation, breathing exercises, visualization. Um, along with some just core content okay, that's inspirational. It. One of the most difficult situations we can face in life is seeing someone who hurt us, disappointed us, betrayed us with new eyes. See, having new eyes doesn't have anything to do with the other person. It has to do with you. It means seeing yourself as stronger, wiser as a result of the situation. It also means seeing the situation as absolutely necessary in your own growth and development. Now, I'm here to tell you that isn't always easy. All of these videos, audios, are, are generally three minutes or, or less. And then lastly, a couple other uh, features relative to the, uh, the uh, recently launched application. If I know that, that uh, Monday morning, Sunday afternoons are tough as I begin to think about the work week ahead, uh, the mobile app will reach out and give me a reminder. Um, and then there's lots of kind of interesting ways that we track uh, mood. Again, trying to be familiar and contemporary against the photographic affect 16-point uh, diagram with a number of taps over different periods of time. So we can uh, do different ways to, to present the, the moods. Um, lastly, um, we're, we're excited about the, the roadmap. Um, we focus on depression and anxiety. As I said, we're very excited about the ongoing conversations here at the University of Michigan. We started to, to really begin to scope out other conditions, particularly chronic pain management, as we work with a number of our commercial providers. That really has been uh, voiced as a, uh, a acute issue uh, that really needs and lends itself to some of the technology applications that we've developed. Um, and then lastly, we monitor and measure outcomes in a range of different ways, from basic engagement on site, time on site, self-reported satisfaction, to embedded clinical measures, such as the depression, anxiety, stress scale 21. And so when a consumer comes in, first day, they get a baseline assessment, and then at 30, 60, 90, 180 days, we resurvey the consumer so we can begin to understand basic trending. And as we've continue to really ramp up pretty considerably our user population. Um, these are some of the more recent results. And what's encouraging for us is we're seeing very good activity, consumers coming back, spending a lot of time on the site, and also beginning to evidence uh, in the early stages with some of the cohorts, um, good outcomes improvement as, as measured by DAS. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Scott. Our, our next speaker will be Helen Stallmond, who has come all the way from Australia, uh, the University of Queensland. And as some of you may know, Australia is home to a lot of the leading research in the world on youth mental health. I think maybe along with the US,
probably the, those are the two countries where there's the most activity in terms of research in this area. And, and Helen is one of the leading researchers in Australia on, on specifically on college student, uh, I guess you would call it university student, not maybe, we do. not college. Um, and so Helen is gonna tell you about some of her online programs and how they've also integrated them to some extent with, with a school curriculum. Uh, thanks, Daniel, um, and I, I'm really pleased to be here um, amongst people doing such great work with um, depression and mental health issues in college students, though we call them university students over in Australia. Um, I hope you can all understand my accent. Um, where I come to student mental health from is a number of areas. I've worked as a clinical psychologist with college students. Um, I also from my own teaching experience with students and also then as a researcher. Um, my colleagues and I um, started to come together with um, using online programs to address this issue of student mental health, firstly due to the high prevalence of psychological distress in students and really thinking about ways of getting students access to supports um, long before they need treatment for mental health problems. Um, also because of the amount of disability that students face just from having distress, um, let alone having very serious levels of distress and mental health problems. Um, students that we've surveyed um, with very high levels of distress on average lose half of the previous month where they're either unable to completely do their studies or they need to cut back, which is just enormous. Um, and, and then in addition to that, just the cost um, of services and resources that we, we can't possibly treat the number of people face to face who could probably benefit from certain services. So what we looked at was universal interventions. So how can we actually get services to all students? And by doing that, um, one of the things that we often focus on in Australia, and I'm not sure if you do it here, is we often group students into categories of at-risk students um, for all sorts of reasons where um, there may be correlations with higher levels of having difficulties at university. But one of the issues with that is that quite a few students in at-risk categories will go on to have no difficulties at all, and students who don't fit into one of those at-risk categories can go on to have troubles. So that if we're only targeting certain groups of students, we're actually missing out on a lot of students. Um, and so by doing that, what we've done with our interventions is embed them within the curriculum. Um, because the feedback we get from counselling services is that students don't go um, to workshops and things that they, they put on. And in our own um, focus groups with students and when we ask them what kind of things they would need, the things they list off are things that already exist at the university but they've got no idea that they exist. So we wanted to find a way of actually linking back to things that already exist, not just replicating things. Um, so our number one principle was being inclusive of all students. Um, the second one, for obvious reasons, is to promote academic achievement. Obviously, that's the goals of the colleges and universities that we work in and ultimately the people who will fund interventions. But also, that's the goal of our students. I think one of the things that puts students off in terms of labelling things mental health is that that's not their focus. They don't want to identify themselves as having mental health problems. And really what they're focused on is getting good grades and graduating. And so what we need to do is then take our interventions and align that with what the student goals are, rather than waiting for students to come to us with what our goals might be for them. Our third principle is really promoting self-management. We really want to support students' autonomy, support their independence, their problem-solving skills, we don't want to take that over for them. We don't want to parent them, um, but we want to provide adequate support so that they can be successful at um, college or university. And going along with that, I really see well-being as a graduate attribute. 
um, along with all the other skills, the critical thinking skills, the, the problem solving skills that we want in our graduates, I think we really need to have well-being up there. Um, because our, our students can't succeed out there in their future careers and their jobs and, and be leaders um, in the next generation without a sense of well-being. Um, the next point I think is really important, and this comes down to minimally sufficient. Um, we have a certain amount of resources, um, and while we all say that we need more resources, it's really difficult financially to get more resources. But also I'm thinking in terms of time, um, people only have a certain amount of time, and that's students um, as well as staff. But also we don't want to waste resources, so we really only want to provide what is the minimally sufficient support to a student that they actually need rather than giving them excessive services. And lastly, and I, I come to this one as both a practitioner and a lecturer and, and also a former student, is it's got to be sustainable. We can make wonderful things that are going to take a lot of effort on the part of a lot of people, um, both the consumer and, and people in terms of setting it up. Um, and, and people aren't just going to get involved in that. It has to be easy. It has to be easy for students to use. Uh, it has to be easy for staff to get on board with. So they're the principles that we used when we um, designed two of the interventions that I'm going to show you now. Um, the first one is what we call the learning thermometer. The learning thermometer I see as a support structure. It, it actually doesn't do a lot on its own. It, it's a, um, a program, an online program, where students actually reflect on how they're going four times each semester within a course. Uh, and what they're reflecting on is how well they're going academically and how well they're going in terms of their own well-being. Um, and the whole model of the learning thermometer is set up around a problem-solving um, paradigm. And, and firstly, as you can see there, students firstly learn to reflect. And, and that's one of the skills that we see as critical to self-awareness is just this ability to think about how am I going. What the learning thermometer then does is give students personalised feedback depending on how they're going. If they're going okay, they just get some positive feedback and the whole thing takes uh, about five minutes for them to do. If they mention that they're having some sort of issues in either their academic work or their well-being, then they're linked up with some um, supports. And again, this is done in a, a self-management way. Firstly, we tell them strategies that other students find useful, and, and they're the things that other people have talked about in this conference, things such as, are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating right? Are you exercising? Are you turning up at the lectures? Are you doing the, the reading material? Um, and that's really to show them that there's things that I can take on board all by myself without telling anyone else. The second one is resources I can access, um, and one of those is the desk, which I'm going to talk about shortly. That's our second program. But that's also links to things like you might have on your counselling site. So it could be workshops, it could be tip sheets, it, it could be any sorts of resources that are out there that you'd like to link your students in with um, that they might not even be aware exist. Um, and then the third one is that there's actually people who can help too. And, and they're not all mental health people. It could be your tutor, your lecturer, could be your course coordinator, but then it could also be the health service or the counselling service or, or your disability service. So suddenly students are linked with a whole lot of things that might be useful. But then what we ask them to do is pick two or three of those that maybe you're not doing at the moment that you think might personally help you. And when they tick those, they're emailed a personalised learning plan. So they've got a record of that. There's also there's also a whole lot of group teaching feedback that the lecturers get on the learning thermometer that I'm not going to go into now. But none of that individual data ever goes to anyone else. And that's, again, part of this autonomy. It's just a structure to help students think through how am I going to solve this problem and, and hopefully result in, in better graduate outcomes. Um, the second program we developed was called The Desk. Um, and again, the desk 
was really developed and supported by our national depression initiative called Beyond Blue. They put a lot of money into this. Um, it's, it's really um, focused on university and college students. Um, and this is very different from a lot of online programs out there at the moment that, and we've got a couple of really good ones in Australia, Moo Gym, eCouch, which are all very mental health focused. They're all focused on the general population and they're all very linear programs. You work through a structure. What we wanted was something that fits in for students um, and works the way that they use the internet. Um, so what it is, students can go in and do as little or as much as they want. Um, we have a whole lot of modules covering really common issues that students face, like coping with anxiety and worries, um, feeling stressed, um, relationships, so maintaining relationships, dealing with conflict, and then issues around feeling healthy, and, and that includes some body image things. Um, and then we have a whole lot of tools in there as well. And the tools are things we would see students using uh, on a more regular basis than the modules. And they're things like how to solve a problem, how to use feedback from an assignment, things like mindfulness, relaxation. Um, but we also have links to really good to other tools that are out there, such as we have some great financial resources as well. Um, so as you can see, the aim here was for, for it to all be normal. We wanted to normalise this experience of stress that students go through at university. And as you can see from our heading, it's about promoting success and well-being. And nowhere on this website do we talk about mental health. Um, and also our funding body, Beyond Blue, who has um, a 90% brand recognition, were really good in, in allowing us not to put their brand on the homepage because we said, look, it suddenly becomes a mental health site and we want to be a success site. Um, and in addition to that, we, we have a lot of quizzes because, again, young people love taking quizzes. They might not necessarily like to do modules. And what the quizzes do, yeah, there's quizzes on all sorts of things, but at the end of the quiz, it'll tell you how you're going, but it'll also recommend some modules for you. And again, you don't need to do those modules, but there's an area that will save those for you. So if you ever come back later, um, you can say, I wonder what modules would be useful for me. And in that area, it also saves copy of any work that students work on. So they get summary sheets, so they can always go back and reflect on those. Um, so this is what our homepage looks like. Um, I mentioned earlier we wanted to link students back in with existing resources, so um, universities can have their own logo on the homepage and that's actually a link back to their university. Um, and we also have a section over to the right called Get Help. And Get Help is a whole lot of things like careers and academic skills and postgraduate students. And in there is all links to key things back on the university site that we're not covering, but we want to link them back in and let them know what's out there on their own site. As you can see, we also wanted it to be something um, I've talked about not um, um, making a mental health site. So the desk just looks like everybody's desk. Um, you can change those pictures um, by just putting in your own pictures. So it can become very personalised. We also have a coffee house, um, and the coffee house, again, is just to engage students in a social aspect. Um, Beyond Blue is actually running a competition at the moment where you upload your artwork, and whoever gets the most likes on their artwork will win an iPad. We also have forums on the coffee house where different parts of the university can run forums. Um, so ones that we've got, we've got a peer mentor who runs one of the forums. We have our UQ Sport, which is our sporting organisation that, that's running one. We have a writing group up there. So um, that, that's really just engage students with the whole site. That The people who come to the site are students who want to be successful, not students who have problems. So very much a prevention um, aspect to it. Um, so the ways that we're embedding the desk, besides being a link on the learning thermometer, we've also 
got PowerPoint slides that we give out to all lecturers, and they don't need to know about the desk, but it, they can use them at key moments during the semester. So if, for example, the assignment's due in two weeks, we have a slide that says, is procrastination a problem? You might want to go to the desk. So they're like little mini ads. Um, if you're handing back assessment, you can put up how to use assignment feedback, you know, go to the desk. Um, and this is all around the idea of being relevant. Students don't remember things if they're not relevant. Um, and by using these tool, tools combined, we can actually ensure that students have a scaffold and have the resources whenever it's relevant to them. Um, and, and so I guess just to summarise, our key messages are that we really want to be preventative uh, as much as possible in preventing mental health problems from occurring in the first place. Um, we really believe that all students can be resilient. Um, and we think that online is a way of actually getting around a lot of the barriers that typically stop students from seeking help, um, such as wanting to deal with things on their own, such as problems that often arise at 3 a.m. in the morning, and, and these kind of things are available 24 hours a day. Thank you. Before I introduce our last, our last panelists, I want to mention that there should be some note cards going around uh, if you want to write down questions, which will then be brought up to me and I can read them to the panelists at the end. Um, also there are microphones, there's one over there and one over there, so you can also ask your question directly uh, once, once the next panelists go. And, the, and they're actually sticking to the, the there are a lot of time so far, so we should have a good amount of time for questions and discussion, so please give some thought to that. Our, our last panelists are Blake Wagner Jr. and Blake Wagner III, father-son team, and I'll let you guess which one is which. <laughs> uh, and they're, uh, they're, they, they're, they've been developing a, a video-based intervention, and they're from uh, Ohio State Buckeye country, by the way. <laughs> so. Blake and Blake, <laughs> with that. <laughs> Not very humble. Okay, yeah, thanks. If you whisper, one person can hear you. If you chit chat over a cup of coffee, one, two, maybe the creepy guy behind you can hear you. If you speak in an auditorium, 30, 50, 100 people could hear you. If you post a brief video online, the world could hear you. About 18 months ago, I turned to my dad, who's a clinical psychologist, and I asked him, how many folks could you see in one session? And he said, one, maybe two if it's a couple. How many folks could you see in a week? 30, 35. If a YouTube video of a skateboarding dog could accumulate 20 million hits, <laughs> surely we can reach people with a much more meaningful and helpful message. And that was the premise for Ink Blots, which was wedded with my personal story, which I'd like to share with you. It's our most recent film called Trapped. This is a very difficult but important film uh, for me to create, and I hope you enjoy it. Like. Have you ever felt trapped in the blink of an eye my whole life fell apart my grandfather who is my best friend developed progressive dementia I 
began to drink. Several months later, I suffered from a spinal cord injury that resulted in partial paralysis. I began to drink more. A lot more. Then, on what happened to be my 22nd birthday, we buried my mother. Ready for the icing on the cake, Lindsay, the person I plan to spend the rest of my life with, ended our relationship through a text message. I can assure you, this didn't help the drinking to taper off. I worried, I avoided, took every little thing personally, collapsed spiritually, curbed my appetite, stopped exercising, just shut down. And some days, I never left my room. I became depressed, I became despondent, I became hopeless. Nothing mattered anymore. I felt at times like ending my life so that I could end my suffering. I dug myself into a hole that I could not get out of alone. It was my roommate Joe, who had only known for a couple of months, who recognized the signs of depression and hopelessness. Unfortunately, he cared enough to drag me to therapy. I was fixated at all the things that I couldn't change, and these mental habits were making me miserable. Why is it that when difficult, challenging, and even tragic things happen, our focus gets consumed in the loss, the closed door? My therapist taught me radical acceptance, the practice of accepting life just the way it is, and finding ways to cope with whatever type of closed door we face. I could either choose to be miserable about my life and stay stuck in the past, or I could choose to accept where I'm at and find ways of creating new meaning in my life. Right now, think of a door that closed in your life, some hurt or disappointment, maybe a rejection or failure, or maybe it's a choice you made you cannot forgive yourself for. Next, journal about a door that subsequently opened, how you grew from the loss. Maybe as a result of your pain, you've experienced deepened relationships, new possibilities, greater appreciation of life. My amazing mother, despite being riddled with cancer, was able to find joy in each day. She often reminded me and my brothers that the present is perfect, even if it doesn't look or feel that way. Remember, tiny shifts can lead to big changes. Good luck. If you haven't guessed it, I am the father. And uh, every time I see that, I get so emotional seeing my late wife. I was married for 28 years to the most awesome uh, woman on earth, in my opinion. And uh, with cancer, you have this strange dynamic of, with advances of treatment of basically living with death over a prolonged period of time. And Sue had the cancer in her liver and lungs uh, for over a two-year period. And it's very, very difficult, very challenging. And I remember um, she was such a selfless human being that she never wanted us to be troubled. And uh, she'd always say, I'm okay, don't worry about me. She was a person of deep faith. And I remember one day we were the woods by our house and, and running with our dogs, our Labradoodle and our Collie. And she was actually walking with her iPod and I was uh, jogging with the, the animals. And, 
and I came up behind her, and it was one of only two times in that whole period that I saw her break down and cry. She didn't know I was uh, there. And she said, there must be some purpose for this. There must be some purpose for her to leave her three sons. And my youngest was 12 at the time. And, and um, it was at that moment that I committed myself to uh, finding some purpose, to some type of meaning making, as we learned in the movie Trapped. And just to give you a little bit of my background, I've uh, offered student assistance program services to colleges, nursing schools, technical colleges, universities, liberal arts colleges for the past two decades. And, um, and we've struggled like all of us do on how to reach and engage students. As Helen said, so many students don't, ident don't identify themselves as having mental health problems. And there's the whole stigma issue and, and all these barriers. But we decided to take a focus group approach, a more true marketing approach, and really uh, go directly to the students and find out uh, what they want, what they need, and what they'd be willing to use. And basically, we found that uh, they want uh, very brief interventions. At one time, a few number of years ago, we developed a Take Charge of Your Life kind of life coaching uh, online seminar module, and we focused on student success stories. But it was 45 minutes, and we found out that was too long for students, especially non-traditional students or students that are working in addition to going to school. Secondly, they wanted things that were relevant. Uh, they may not see major depression or generalized anxiety disorder sometimes, but for many others, they may not see that as relevant. But they do know what it feels like to be out of balance, to have financial problems, relationship concerns, perfectionism, and such. We also found it was much more effective using a more student-to-student -student approach uh, Blake is generally the host of the Inkblot episodes as opposed to someone uh, my age. And finally, practical. You know, it's one thing to motivate people, but today people want a takeaway. They want a coping skill that they can use uh, right away. So the basic design of the Inkblot's episodes, first some type of an emotional hook. My favorite episode is Mr. Potato Head, and it's about relationship conflict, and it starts off with isn't it, Blake says, he's jumping over these giant boulders. I don't know how you did that, Blake. But um, isn't it crazy how strongly our moods are tied to our relationship? Talk to any college student, that is exactly how they feel, that relationship between uh, the, the, their intimate relationships and how they feel. Uh, secondly, we try to have some type of compelling story Ever since there were carvings on walls in prehistoric times, people are brought in or captivated by a good story. We try to use metaphors that stick. My second favorite uh, episode is called Dominoes. It's based on this metaphor about Blake and his grandmother, and they had spent all afternoon lining up dominoes, had them in a perfect position. But you know, when they went to tip them to see if they get them all to topple down, if one of those dominoes out of a thousand was out of place, the whole afternoon would be a disaster, the all or nothing thinking. And um, so many times I've had people come up to me and say, Dr. Wagner, you know, I had the situation, I was all upset. Uh, th this woman, for example, came up, a college student, was quite overweight and she was at work and um, she was, they had some type of a, a function in the cafeteria and they had the kitchen, the tables, uh, mounted up on the, they would lift the table so that they are mounted up on the wall. And again, being a heavy person, she leaned and somehow a hinge broke off and the table collapsed. She went to her office and just broke down, sobbing hysterically. And she started to write out her uh, letter of resignation. She felt it was so humiliating that this table had broken and, and given her weight and such. And then she remembered dominoes. And she told herself, you know, this is just one crooked domino in my life. And she stopped and she breathed and she asked herself, what would my best friend say to me about this situation? She tore up the letter of resignation and walked back out into the cafeteria. What if we could all walk into our fears like that? 
So we try to use practical metaphors, the runaway elevator, uh, Mr. Potato Head, uh, fireflies, just things that kind of stick in our mind because we only have three to four minutes. We found if we go beyond the length of a YouTube video, people kind of tune things out. Uh, and then finally, a specific coping skill. I teach at Ohio State and, and we've been careful to use evidence-based coping skills that uh, raise people's coping efficacy. We call it, uh, Blake talks about tiny shifts leading to big changes. What if you thought of the most difficult relationship in your life right now? And what if next time when the person starts to criticize and complain, what if you could actually listen and validate them? Look for the kernel of truth of what they said. It might make a big change in your life. So we try to do that with every episode. What if next time you're stressed, you're able to use a breathing technique uh, where you could bring yourself into the present moment instead of stressing out or or getting down on yourself? What if you could give yourself permission to be human? What if you lowered your standards just 10%? Blake does another film where he was treading water. I think what, Blake, how cold was it that day? It was unbelievable. It was in November in Ohio. Yeah, it was not a good day to be in the water, but uh, <laughs> boy, he goes above and beyond to make these films. But. Uh, <laughs> But it was that feeling, you know, I think we all get from time to time of treading water, just the constant pressures 24-7. Uh, Blake has only been here two months, and, and Dan and his groups have been able to actually put together seven grants. The person he works with yesterday is emailing him at 3.30 in the morning, and I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is crazy. But it's very exciting at the same time. Some of the themes that we have in Inkblots are self-acceptance, self-compassion. Again, treating yourself like your own best friend. Giving yourself permission to be human. Self-care, life balance, gratitude, mindfulness, and of course, asking for help. We've been using this at several universities, Inkblots episodes, for student and parent orientations. It's really neat for the parents to get an idea of, of some of the issues that students face and and uh, become aware of the counseling service. Uh, we've used them for freshman survival courses. You can email them to students, post them on the university website. Uh, counseling centers can use them to gear discussions in groups or individual counseling. And uh, so we're really, uh, really excited about what Dr. Eisenberg is doing here. Um, Dr. Graydon in the Depression Center have supported the first grant to allow us to begin to um, establish an evidence-based and we we're not being too unrealistic you know these are only three to four minute videos but again being able to um, have so many people potentially view them and make tiny shifts is what this project is all about to us thank you I think it's kind of last call for the note cards, and if people would like to come up to the, the microphone and ask a question directly of the panelists, that would be welcome too. Perhaps while we wait for someone to step up, um, I do have some questions for the panelists myself. Uh, so one question would be, uh, and this is, I think, for any of the panelists, really, is uh, w one of the challenges with online interventions is, of course, engaging people, and particularly young people for, who have so many options and things they like to do on, online. How do you keep them in an intervention? How do you draw them to it? And I think the, the Wagners have one approach, but, but I, I guess it would be good to hear from the panelists about other strategies or other things that you're using in your work or you're thinking about using? Shall I start? Is this on? Um, I think one of, one of the big things that we found is timeliness. Um, a lot of our stuff goes out during orientation week, which is when students are trying to work out where they need to go, what do they need to do, what courses should they be enrolled in. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why they, they have no idea what's out there. Um, and I think 
think trying to find ways when it's actually really relevant to them is one of the first ways that they, they're going to engage because they are actually overwhelmed with the amount of information that they need to get um, and that they're constantly exposed to. So that I think that's one strategy is just finding out when's most relevant for them. I would add just a couple things, and again, we're not currently focused on the student population, though we're very hopeful that as we work, Daniel, with you and the team here, that we'll begin to pilot. I think at a broader level, engagement has historically been a challenge for mobile applications and online applications, and, and I think for us, the way that we're trying to address it is a couple. The first is, again, back to my earlier remarks, at the end of the day, the most trusted resource are many of you in this room who are frontline health professionals. And so we really want to make sure that those frontline health professionals introduce and support the technology. And we spent a lot of time training and, and orienting the professionals to, to best refer and use my strength. Um, I think the second, and, and I think um, Helen made reference to this, is the relevance. Um, we have continued to evolve this personalized homepage and really restricting the amount of content. Um, it's our belief that most of what's available on the internet is overwhelming to an already overwhelmed populace, particularly those suffering from anxiety or depression. And so we think it's very important to try to really understand um, what's important to that individual. Our tagline is the health club for your mind, and we like that to destigmatize the experience, but also we appreciate that consumers go to a gym and, and they like to do different things. And so we think that relevance factor is important. I think the biggest recent learning for us has been around motivation. And, and again, very abridged commentary in, in my opening remarks, but um, really understanding that when a consumer can barely get out of bed, a student can get out of bed, and even turning on the computer can seem incredibly daunting, what we're working on is in our next release is dynamically reshifting content. So in that particular case, if that student or consumer says that I have very low motivation, um, we're going to give them in the moment what we call my strength now coping tools. When they start to elevate up in motivation, we'll give them more of the e-learning content where they can begin to work on some of the more sustainable changes. So those are kind of three of the areas that, that we try to work on relative to engagement. Thanks. Did, did you guys want to add anything? I just remember for years, literally, uh, sitting with a group of uh, university officials scratching our heads about how we can attract students, whether we can have some blue man booth at the health fair or uh, some topic that would bring people in to support groups. And I really think, as we've all been saying, that we need to kind of have a paradigm shift away from thinking that we're going to bring them into us, but rather enter the world where they live. All right, I have a very practical question from someone in the audience, which is, how would one gain access to these materials? Is there a cost? Oh, I'll start with that. Um, the desk is available free of charge to everyone. Um, the learning thermometer we actually license to organisations and they run through particular courses. Uh, the ink blots videos, I have them posted on a website, so I'd be happy to share that link with, that link with anyone that would like to come up afterwards. And currently for my strength, we're working with healthcare payers and providers and they uh, enter into a licensing arrangement with us. Um, though any of the members here at the conference, if they'd like to have guest access and or kind of download the apps, I'd be happy to provide that to you. Great. Thanks. An another question is uh, about for, for Scott is, could my strength tie in with a therapist working with a teen or student? For example, a child away at school who doesn't want to switch therapists. Um, and again, we're, we're very excited about the learning process as we begin to partner with the University of Michigan and, and complete certain grants. The, the whole design of my strength is to work as an augmentation to direct intervention, um, to serve uh, in that capacity, but also as a standalone resource. As Helen mentioned, a 7 by 24 hour resource as well. Currently though, the way that it's configured is the, the resource is confidential. Uh, it's HIPAA aligned and we don't share information with anyone, including the clinician, uh, other than aggregated reports. 
Um, there's a lot of complexity and, and risk associated with um, how we think through opening up full transparency when a consumer interacts with technology back to the clinician. Uh, for example, if the student and or consumer references some uh, suicide suicidality and the clinician kind of misses the technology trigger, you know, we really haven't figured out that yet, I think, as a, as a uh, provider network around technology. And so for us, it's a standalone resource that operates in, in parallel. So in that particular case, the, the student could absolutely begin to access my strength um, and likely follow similar interventions, particularly evidence-based practices like CBT and mindfulness acceptance that likely the therapists that they were working with used uh, directly. A question at the microphone. Is for Blake. I, uh, first and foremost, thanks for sharing your story. That was Thank very you. relevant and emotionally impactful. Thank um, you. Wh where do you see Inkblot, you know, a year or two years from now, and, and how would you measure the success of that in your mind? Boy, it's a great question. Um, so, as my dad mentioned earlier, we have a lot of grants in the pipeline. So we're going to be reaching a lot of uh, subpopulations. We're going to be uh, producing films for. Uh, folks with eating disorders and also working on films that address like peer gatekeeping uh, training so to teach students like what like signs and symptoms to look for across the board if it's depression or eating disorders or such so I think as we sort of spread um, and we're also looking into the employer population as well um, and um, I think the ultimate goal you know is to reach as many people and find out ways to uh, disseminate them most effectively. You know, I don't know if it would necessarily be on YouTube or if it should, if, you know, if it lived on a, on, a, on a single site, you know, how do we disperse it to the, the masses? So that's ultimately, and I'd also, I, I guess I could mention, we uh, are interested in engaging um, some of the students here. We're gonna be running a, a film competition uh, well, we hope, fingers crossed, <laughs> that's another grant, but, um, and getting other people's stories. And so I really was hoping, you know, would spark, because through my struggle, I realized that, you know, I'm not the only one that is under tremendous stress and has all of these issues. And so it was certainly um, in my mind, if I, if I came forward, you know, maybe others would too, and, uh, and, and it would spread, so. Well, I, w I wish you luck. I, I have a separate question for Scott uh, as it pertains to um, you showed how you guys aggregate content that seems to be more positive or inspiring uh, that you show to your users based on certain conditions. Can you talk to the methodology on how you aggregate that content and how you deem content or how you approve it for your, uh, for your site? I, I, I lost on the second one. Aggregate it and then what the, improve it? Well, I guess I'm, I'm curious on the methodology and how you've deemed uh, appropriate content to feed your users based on, um, you know, their state of mind. Great. So, so just at the foundation and as a former online university president, our model was to work with large textbook publishers and start with great content, uh, but really apply uh, our expertise to take great content and, and transform it into a virtual online academic experience. And truthfully, we follow the same model with my strength, where we've gone out and partnered with the, really the dominant largest publisher of evidence-based content. And so we start, we have the tremendous benefit of starting with acclaimed um, content that I would imagine many of the clinicians in this room have probably interacted with. Um, and so that's really the, the underpinning, these e-learning modules. Um, we have a clinical advisory board as well as two um, uh, behavioral health experts on staff. We have a chief clinical officer and a clinical director who really guide the fundamental framework of all of our content. Um, and so that's kind of the, the next level of, of good clinical due diligence. And then lastly, the profile that we're beginning to continually refine is really helping to, um, at, at the consumer level, really shape that experience. So when they get to their home page, what, what we want to make sure is when they, they get information that's very relevant to them. And so we ask questions about weight and smoking, and they get to do an assessment using DOS 21, and we ask them about spirituality, and then through all these behind-the-scenes algorithms, when they come to the page, 
they're either going to get a depression or anxiety interactive program based upon DAS, DAS 21, and then the profile questions will help to populate some of the other components of their homepage. Thanks. All right, we have just a few more minutes, so one or two more questions. This question, I believe, applies mainly to my strength, uh, to, to Scott and, and to Helen as well, is uh, how do you handle the duty to report issues with online interventions? Do you have a method to review reports of suicidality, homicidality, abuse? How liable are you for not reporting? Yeah, this, uh, it's a wonderful, um, relevant, and very important question. Um, and we've spent a tremendous amount of time with clinicians, um, unfortunately, fortunately, with lawyers, really thinking through that. And so the way that we have constructed the site, um, which references some of my earlier comments, this is a standalone password protected site. And we go to great lengths um, to include a user agreement that the user has to sign uh, that indicates that this is a non-monitored resource um, and that if obviously they are at a, a heightened level of distress um, that, that this is likely not the, the right tool. Throughout the consumer experience, whether it be the e-learning modules along with the personal homepage, we're always making prominent the direct contact numbers of the healthcare provider uh, that we've engaged with. Again, kind of our model is we're working directly with clinicians who are generally referring patients to MyStrength. So they're making the first level determination. And then once they get to the site, we're co-branding that experience with all of that provider's direct numbers. Um, lastly, we do have some mood tracking capability. Um, and what we've built in are some indicators such that if a consumer starts to evidence over a, a consecutive three-week period that they're moving in a, in a, in a downward and negative direction, we're increasingly sending more and more information out to them in terms of speaking to someone directly, reinforcing the direct um, contact numbers. Um. Similarly, on our site, um, our terms and conditions spell out firstly what the site is. We're not a treatment site, so we're actually never asking things about suicidality um, and things like that. What we, one of our quizzes though is um, how's my mood going? Um, and if people score in the high range of that, we immediately give them feedback about who they need to contact and that they, they really should contact someone. We also have in the Get Help section, which is a section linking back to um, both university and um, also community resources, we have a, one of our headings is I'm thinking about suicide and that has the emergency national numbers that people can call immediately so that they can get help. All right, well I think that's all the time we have for this session. Let's give a hand to our panelists. <laughs>
because that's what those who run businesses of education, namely colleges or schools, pay attention to. And secondly, how can we start doing things where we accurately measure and reduce suicide rates, even attempts for that matter. So if we improved educational graduation rates and decreased tragedies for those who really have these problems, we would then be able to say, hey, we need more resources, help us out. So in the meantime, my only comment is, give us suggestions about how we can improve this particular colloquium seminar, symposium, conference, whatever we call it, and suggestions for what we might do next year. And thank you very much. Travel safely. The snow was actually kind of dramatic and beautiful. So. Um, oh. uh, just real briefly, my name is Todd Sevig, and I'm the uh, director of the Student Counseling Center here on campus. And as one of the co-chairs, I have to tell you, it's one of the highlights of the year to work on this conference uh, with uh, John, who founded this thing. It was an idea in his head 12, 13 years ago, maybe even more, um, and then when uh, Daniel joined in the planning committee. I have two thoughts. What we've tried to do, and it's my invitation, invitation for you to take with you, uh, that in think about what we've done in 28 hours, since one o'clock yesterday, 27 hours, I guess, um, multidisciplinary. Nowhere else, I think, in the country, in 27 hours, can you get pictures of the brain, social media, advances right off the press uh, for technology, student stories and who take... And global. And global, <laughs> other countries. <laughs> Uh, but uh, student stories of the experience of all this that offer us, and this is my second thing, that offer us hope and resiliency. As consumers, as for those of us who have suffered from mental illness, people in our family, professionals, faculty, staff, students. And then the last comment I have is perseverance. What we, we have done this conference for 11 years. I guess it's part of the vision at some point to not have to have a conference like this, but we will persevere until we do. And a six inch snowstorm isn't gonna stop us, so. <laughs> uh, lastly, I think maybe the most important thing to say is a big thank you to Trish Meyer and her team. Uh, Trish is rarely willing to actually come up here on the stage. I don't know if we've ever actually gotten you up here on the stage, but at least she's in the room this time. She's in the back, in the shadows. <laughs> the, the, uh, the success of this conference, and I think the fact that it, it seems to get better each year is, I think, attributable to Trish more than anything else. So we're looking forward to next year. Thank you.